Welcome to Utah State University's Vertebrate Paleontology course. My name is Benjamin Berger, and in this lecture, we will discuss the origin and evolution of frogs, salamanders, and Sicilians, the list amphibia, the modern amphibians during the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. The list amphibia is a monophyletic clade that includes modern amphibians as well as one extinct group called the Albane Eryptodonte. Modern amphibians are split into three major groups. The Gymnophona, which includes the legless amphibians called Sicilians, which live underground in tropical regions of the world. The Aenura, the frogs, and the Yordella, including the salamanders which are sometimes called the caldata, since they have adult tails. Now, early tetrapods arose from the aquatic environment during the late Paleozoic, and they split into two major groups, based in part on the formation of the centrum in the vertebrae, the temnospondylins and the leptospondylins. Now, both of these groups were very successful during the late Paleozoic era, even into the Permian period. Now at the Permian-Triassic boundary, there was a major extinction event, one of the worst ever, and many of these early groups vanished. The Temnos bundles were reduced to two groups, the Trimatosauria and the Captiosauria, and the Leptospondylins were reduced to the Amiota, which arose during the late Paleozoic, and of which includes reptiles, birds, and mammals. Modern list amphibians appear for the first time near the Permian-Triassic boundary, with some of the earliest frogs and salamanders dated to this time in Earth's history. Now, the origin of list amphibians is often placed within the Temnospondylins. This is because of similarities in the skull with the earlier fossil temnospondylins. Yet, as mentioned previously, in the earliest fossils of list amphibians, the vertebral centrum may have resembled a leptospondylin condition. And some authors have even suggested that leptospondylin uh, might have been the origin for some groups of list amphibians. The Permian Triassic transition was a turbulent period in Earth's history. The modern amphibians arose at a time when the continents had come together to form a single landmass called Pangaea. Now, during the long evolution of modern amphibians, the continents have slowly migrated and split away from each other, leaving amphibians isolated on particular continents. Now, researchers have been looking at the molecular divergences of amphibians to attempt to place the origin of various groups within geographic regions. Frogs, for example, seem to have diversified after the breakup of the continents, particularly during the Cenozoic, while likely originating in the southern Gondwana. While salamanders arose in the north in Laurasia, and Sicilians in the early Atlantic Rift region. The fossil record currently supports these regions in the origin of the major groups of modern amphibians. But let's look at the fossil record of each of these groups. The Gymnophona, better known as the Sicilians, are legless amphibians that live in tropical climates, and they burrow in loose leaf and soil material and often are not seen on the surface. They look a lot like brightly colored earthworms. They have tough, compact skulls and tiny eyes, many being blind. They're found in Central and South America, uh, Southeast Asia, and West and East Africa in dense, tropical, wet forests. Both living and fossil forms are not found in Australia, which may mean that they originated globally only after the separation of Australia during the late Jurassic period. One of the most interesting things about living Sicilians is their parental care. They provide to the young. 
Sicilians have internal fertilization. While some modern species lay eggs, others have live birth. The young are often guarded and protected by the mother. In the species Bolingia guria tatena, the mother sheds her skin, which is fed on by the young as nourishment for later growth. Now, some have gills and are fully aquatic during their entire life, while others live in moist soils feeding on earthworms. Now, it's the abundance of underground invertebrates, such as insects and earthworms, that provide a rich source of food to these creatures. And the rise of Sicilians during the Mesozoic era likely was a result of the increased diversity of earthworms and other subterranean invertebrates. Molecular studies have shown that the Gymnophona group likely is the most primitive and earliest group of modern amphibians to originate. But the fossil record only extends to the early Jurassic, as no fossil has been found in the Triassic period yet. The earliest fossil is Eosicilia, from the early Jurassic Cayenta formation of Arizona. It is a remarkable fossil discovery, with an estimated length of about 10 centimeters. The skull is tiny, about a centimeter in length, but is beautifully preserved. The top of the skull features nasal, frontal, and parietal bones, with a reduced eye socket or orbit that likely meant that Eosicilia had a semi-subterranean lifestyle. The palate is open with a large vulmar, a condition found in temnospondylans. Here is a comparison with Eosicilia and the modern Ichthyoophis. And besides a reduction in the size of the orbit, the skulls are very similar in the number and arrangement of bones. Let's now turn to the most common of the modern amphibians, the frogs. Frogs are classified under the scientific names Anura, which means without a tail. The fossil evidence of the origin of frogs showcases a remarkable series of steps in the accumulation of frog-like traits. The oldest member of the Anura is Tridobracteus from the early Triassic of Madagascar, a fantastic transitional fossil. Modern adult frogs have a unique skeleton, which facilitates a locomotor style of spring-loaded hopping or jumping. We can begin to see these traits in the fossil Tridobracteus, as well as some primitive traits as well. Comparing the modern frog skeleton with Tridobracteus, we see that both have a wide, broad skull, a scapula, and a unique pelvis called a urostyle. The urostyle is a unique anatomical feature found only in frogs. The sacral vertebrae are fused into a narrow rod, while the paired ilium run parallel to the rod-like single sacral vertebrae. This provides a hinge for pulling back muscle attachments and tendons that act like a spring to increase the length of the jump in frogs. In the fossil from the Triassic, we can see the formation of the urostyle with the long ilium blades, yet the sacral vertebrae are not completely fused. This primitive urostyle likely gave a shorter hop to the most primitive frog. Notice that in the fossil, the number of vertebrae are unreduced, like in modern frogs, and that Tridobracteus had a longer salamander-like body. Another intriguing early fossil protofrog has been found in the Permian period of Texas called Geobracteus. It's sometimes classified as a temnospondylin, but does have some characteristics we can compare to frogs. 
including a broad, rounded skull. However, it lacks the reduced vertebrae, and the pelvis is not well preserved to see if it had a urostyle. And a few vertebrae are found in the tail. So this fossil might be a close ancestor to frogs, but until a better specimen is found of a urostyle, it will likely remain in the older temnospondylin group of early tetrapods. After the Triassic period, fossil frogs became somewhat abundant in the fossil record. In the late Jurassic Morrison formation here in Utah, abundant fossil frogs have been found, while spectacular fossil frogs from the Laoing shales in China closely resemble modern frog anatomy, well-developed urostyles and a locomotor habit that involved hopping. Thus, frogs lived with the dinosaurs. One thing we don't have in the fossil record of frog evolution is a good record of Mesozoic tadpole fossils. While larval salamanders are known during the Mesozoic, frog tadpoles have remained elusive. Currently, the earliest fossil frog tadpole is from the early Cretaceous of Spain, but by the Eocene, tadpoles are more common in the fossil record. Well-preserved fossil tadpoles are known in the Middle Eocene Green River Formation of Utah, preserved as impressions in the shales. It's no wonder that they are rare as fossils, since they have little ossification of the endoskeleton at this point in their life cycle. The fossil record of Eudela, or Caldata, the salamanders, extends back into the late Jurassic with the fossil Kerus from Kazakhstan. Kerus features a wide, rounded skull with nasal, frontals, and parietal bones. Some of the most amazing fossil salamanders are known from the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous of China. In the same deposits that featured feathered dinosaurs, we have an amazing array of early salamanders. B. Ye Reptodon resembles modern salamanders, but with a wide head. The wider head resembles some of the primitive frogs in early temnospondylins. Modern Eudelia are grouped into two major clades, the Cryptobrachidae and the Salamanderoidae, two groups that likely arose during the early Jurassic and with a fossil record that extends through the second half of the Mesozoic and into the Cenozoic. Now there's one other bizarre fossil group of list amphibians that arose around the same time during the Jurassic period, the extinct Albaneuripteridonte. They are known from Europe and North America and likely arose independently within the list amphibia clade with the oldest fossils from the middle Jurassic. They superficially resemble salamanders, having a classic tetrapod body plan with a tail and lack a urostyle. The skulls have a narrower fusion of bones with the frontal bones fused. The cervical region of the neck is peculiar in having two vertebrae that fit into a ball and socket joint that allow a greater range in head movement. Often confused with fossil salamanders, albanoptrodon bones are often found in, as isolated bones in microcytes and were unique enough to be distinguished from salamanders. Now, over the years, more complete skeletons have shown them to be a unique clade, which died out after the Paleocene in North America but hung on in Europe until the Pliocene, about 2.5 million years ago. One of the most well-known Albariptodons is Westerptodon from the early Cretaceous of England. It is a tiny, tiny little creature, about the size of a paperclip. Fossils and shales have preserved these tiny creatures in detail as to give some idea of what they would have looked like in life. 
Molecular phylogenies of modern listamphibians supports a close relationship between the three living groups of amphibians, with frogs and salamanders forming a closely related sister group. The relationship of the legless Sicilians has been placed at various early branches in the tree. In this example by Anderson et al., they have dropped Sicilians into leptospondylins, and hence outside of the list amphibian clade, with a different origin. Now, because so many of these early fossil tetrapod clades are extinct, the placement of these groups on the tree must be dependent on morphological characteristics. And there are shared similarities with listamphibians and leptospondylins, although most researchers suggest and support a temnospondylin origin for all major groups of modern amphibians. Modern amphibians are in danger and becoming extinct because of the loss of their needed aquatic habitat as well as facing invasive human-introduced diseases. This is particularly dangerous to them given their long history of isolation. Looking at how amphibians and other early tetrapods responded to past extinction events like the Permian-Triassic event, as well as the Paleocene-Eocene global warming events, showcases the precarious position that they uh, occupy today. All right, you should be able to paraphrase the evolution of list amphibians, the modern amphibians, during the Mesozoic and Cenozoic, and how they differ from the early tetrapods that arose during the late Paleozoic era. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about Utah State University's geology program, check out the website geology.usu.edu or my own website at benjaminslashberger.org. Links are found in the description below.